Now let's consider active galaxies. Some galaxies have something extraordinary going on in their centers. We've seen that the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole, but that supermassive black hole isn't doing very much. It's not chewing up matter, although we did see a little X-ray flare from a comet-sized object being consumed. But in general, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is quite dark and not very noticeable. But going back 50 or 60 years to the work of Carl Seifert in the 1940s and 50s, it was known that a set of galaxies out there in space have incredibly bright nuclei, far beyond the brightness we would expect from the set of stars that might be at their centers. So these Seifert galaxies, as they were called then, are spiral galaxies with a very bright star-like center nucleus. They're also very bright in the infrared, so they're putting out a lot of radiation and the radiation is not simply the sum of the energy from stars. Something else is going on. They also show strong emission lines, which indicate rapid gas motions near the nucleus. And as we know, you can use the motions of stuff near the nucleus of a galaxy, gas or stars, to infer the mass of the nucleus. So once again, very massive nuclei. Also variability of these bright regions in the nucleus, where they can vary by the brightness of the entire Milky Way galaxy, in a few weeks or a few months. Another set of objects were discovered in the 1940s and 50s as radio astronomy matured. And these were galaxies emitting large amounts of radio waves. Why is that surprising? Because normal stars simply don't emit radio waves. The sun emits a very feeble amount of radio waves. So if galaxies were only made of a lot of stars, the radio emission should be very weak. But in this case, the radio emission was coming both from the nucleus of the galaxy but also from huge extended lobes or regions far beyond the galaxy. In this diagram, we see the elliptical galaxy in red at the center, in a visible image, and then the blue and green false color is from radio emission, a jet of ionized plasma going out to the top left and another jet going out to the bottom right in opposite directions. Extraordinarily energetic phenomena in this galaxy. So we call these active galactic nuclei. They're galaxies with very active nuclei concentrated in the center. Some of them are making jets of matter shoot out, emitting radio waves, but this ejected material is not cold, although generally it's cold material that emits radio waves. These particles are being accelerated by what we think is the synchrotron process, a non-thermal process where particles move in magnetic fields at close to the speed of light, their energies exceed the world's best accelerators. We already know black holes are gravitational engines, and so we think that black holes can do this. On the right, we see a multi-scale zoom of the M87 giant elliptical galaxy, showing the high energy emission, not the light from the stars that we're familiar with in an optical image. And you can see the jets coming out on the top right in that first inset, and then zooming further in, we get to the central region, and finally, on the bottom right, the famous image of the event horizon of a 3 billion solar mass black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope, released in 2019. AGN, as they're abbreviated, active galactic nuclei, are presumed to represent the energy from matter falling onto a truly vast supermassive black hole. These range from much bigger than the Milky Way solar mass, from 1 billion solar masses for the spiral galaxy NGC 4261 to 3 billion solar masses for the elliptical galaxy M87. The black hole is at the center of a galaxy, and matter is swirling through an accretion disk, as seen in the lower image, before crossing the event horizon. Gravitational potential energy is lost, and the available possible energy is the mass energy, Black holes are such good engines that they can convert 10 up to 40% of mc squared into pure radiant energy. So it's an incredibly efficient source of high energy radiation. This animation is not a true image from astronomy, but it's a simulation of what the accretion disk would look like, the central black hole, and the jet that it creates shooting plasma out into space. The jets themselves are very interesting because they include twisted magnetic fields bound in the accretion disk and the magnetic field from the black hole itself. They pull charged particles out of the disk and accelerate them like a slingshot. Particles are bound to a magnetic field and then focused in a beam. The astrophysics of this is very complicated and was worked out mostly in the 1970s and 80s and finally with computer simulations in the 1990s. 
the orientation of the beam of this jet of emission determines what we see. These things, these galaxies, are randomly oriented in the sky, and so occasionally we will be looking right down the jet. If this jet points at us, we see its emission boosted relativistically into our telescope and our line of sight, and we see what's called a quasar. If it's transverse to the line of sight, like the image on the lower left, then we see a radio galaxy with the jet's beam plasma far out beyond the visible size of the galaxy. The lobes are where the jets impact the intergalactic medium, heating diffused gas in a shock front. Here are two simulations of how the jet might look and its entrained magnetic field. So we have quasars, star-like objects which can be strong radio sources and which have spectra that look nothing like a star. They were named quasars, which is an abbreviation for quasi-stellar radio source, because people found a set of radio sources at very great distances from the Milky Way, which look like stars in the sky. Again, stars don't emit radio waves, so we knew there was something else going on. And when spectra were taken, it was finally seen that they were compact sources at the center of normal galaxies at large distances and incredible luminosities. Gravity engines. And here we can zoom through the scales, seeing that there's something going on in the center of a spiral galaxy, zooming out from the black hole and its accretion disk, surrounding gas and dust, the central star-forming regions of the galaxy, and eventually the entire galaxy comes into view. Quasars were discovered in 1963 by Martin Schmidt, working at Caltech who discovered that these broad emission lines, which were not associated with any Norman element because they were at the wrong positions for the lines of hydrogen or helium or any of the elements. The reason why nobody noticed this is because they're highly redshifted by 10, 20, or even 90 percent of light speed. And so they were shifted to wavelengths that made them completely unrecognizable as normal elements. But in fact, they were the lines of normal elements like hydrogen, helium, carbon, and magnesium just shifted to longer wavelengths into the near-infrared. That indicated the objects were very distant and extremely luminous. Quasars are remote. The most distant ones we've found go out beyond 10 billion light years. And remember, the further out we look in distance, the further back we look in time. And this graph shows putting together the story of quasars, these central supermassive black holes, and it has a life story where they peaked in number and brightness about 8 billion years ago and have faded or died since. So the golden era of quasars, when they lit up the skies and were devouring material and spewing out energy at an enormous rate, are actually long gone and the universe has become quieter. And that's the end of this topic.